Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Today's topic is the Galois correspondence. And no, you haven't clicked on the wrong video. And what I really mean is the topological version of the Galois correspondence. Or strictly speaking, actually, it's not really related to the Galois correspondence as far as I am aware. Um, but it looks very similar. And that's my way of remembering what I'm going to tell you. And that's why I call it the topological Galois correspondence. So um, from Galois theory, we'll see. Uh, strictly speaking, the title of this video is what is a covering space? But, um, uh, well, as we will see, it's about subgroups. So um, let's come back to, well, our, the philosophy of this whole lecture about algebraic topology is that we can't do topology. Topology is too hard. We want to do algebra, right? Um, and kind of everything we see in topology should be reflected in algebra. And maybe everything that is, we see in algebra should also be reflected in topology. Um, that direction is a little bit trickier. So from T to A is, is usually very nice. And um, from A to T is sometimes not so nice or it's questionable what's going on. And kind of, for example, um, that the fundamental group of to two topological spaces are isomorphic doesn't tell you much about the topological spaces. So usually one direction is a little bit, mm, um, but sometimes it's actually pretty nice. And this is one of the cases where it is actually pretty nice. So um, here's a question. So I would like to illustrate this in this example, which I'm going to explain later. So keep this picture in mind. We will return to that later on. But anyway, I have a torus. And all of you know what a torus is. It's, well, a circle across a circle. So you take a circle and uh, wrap it around the circle. Or, a, well, in this picture, you can take a sheet of paper. You can, you can build a torus yourself. You glue, glue those two ends together. Orientation preserving, so matching arrows and arrows. That will create a little band. And that one, you need to wrap around the circle again. So you need to, need to uh, glue those two ends together as well. And then you create a torus T, which of course, you know, all of you know how it looks like it's a donut shape. And because it's S1 cross S1, it's actually not so hard to see uh, that the fundamental group of the torus is, well, Z cross Z, so Z2. Okay, Z cross Z, very good. Um, on the other end, the, the other main player on the slide is a Klein bottle. The Klein bottle is very similar to the, to the torus, and you can also try to build it out of paper. Good luck in R3, by the way. And it's a very similar procedure. So um, you take a piece of paper, you create a circle by gluing things together. You start exactly in the same way, but then you decide to glue um, the other two edges together, orientation reversing. And then you get this immersion if you want to try to do it in, in R3. So you can't, you can't create the surface in R3. It's very similar to the torus, but it doesn't really want to live in R3. And the standard um, illustration usually is something that intersects itself. So you can't build it. Anyway, it's a totally legit uh, topological space. So we could think about it, fundamental group. Um, turns out that the fundamental group is almost Z mod two. I mean, this is almost the torus. Uh, Z mod two, sorry. It's almost Z two. This is almost the torus, right? It, so Z two would be A B two generators, and then the relation is they commute. So you get rid of the center. Uh, you get rid of the centralizer. That's it. So you have two inverses, one for A and one for B, and you almost have the same presentation for the fundamental group of the Klein bottle. Just that one of them is a little bit flawed. One of them has kind of a little bit of a Z mod two thing inside. Um, still, it's not so hard to see that uh, this beast here is actually a subgroup of the other. And so the question that comes to mind is, well, I don't see an immediate connection from the torus to the Klein model, except that they are constructed in a very similar way. Um, but apparently there's, their fundamental groups are crucially related. So this one sits inside the other. Um, actually, it, it almost sits completely inside the other. It's a, it's a twofold thing. Um, so the question, kind of those covering spaces, would like to address, uh, would like 
will answer in the end is kind of what topology corresponds to subgroups of the fundamental group. Seems to be a really nice and um, absolutely valid question, a uh, natural question, right? So we have a group associated topological space. From group theory, we know that subgroups or substructures are extremely important. So what corresponds to subgroups of the fundamental group on the other side, right? On the other side of the of the correspondence on the topological side. So let's have a look at an example. And then let's have a look at another example, and then we'll see the statement. So um, a helix, well, all of you know helixes by now because you know it from, from let's say, DNA, is this wrapping thing, which is, of course, just if you want to identify it. I mean, this is topological, just, just R. I just wrap it a little bit around. So just a real line. And there's a nice map from R to, uh, to, to the circle. And all of you know how it works. It's just the exponential map. And the only tricky part about the exponential map is that you kind of want to work with the complex numbers. So this is the angle, right? So you, you wind around the circle. You have this map running around the circle. And I call it P infinity. It's actually this map P up here. Uh, but let me call it P infinity. You will see in a second why I want to call it P infinity. Anyway, so what? are the properties of this map? Well, it's a nice continuous trajectory. Very good. So that's not so hard to see. With, of course, both spaces uh, have the, so this is S1, both spaces have the natural topology. But there's also something other, something else going on. If you look at a little neighborhood here, so you have a little circle, uh, you have a little point here um, in Z, and you, you look at its prey image, it's like intersecting this thing infinitely often. And at each point, you see a little interval each step you see a little interval and each step you see a little interval right it's here it's here it's here you just see infinitely many of them so um so locally and that's kind of the point locally the s1 and r kind of the same spaces globally they are not right one of them is very compact the other one is infinite but locally they they are basically not distinguishable and um so locally they are the same and well, furthermore, it kind of each point in each neighborhood here appears in infinitely many copies up here because you walk around the circle infinitely often. And you can do it in both directions. So you walk around the circle. So every point has infinitely many copies of itself in R under this map. Uh, let me just call this unwrapping because you kind of take the circle and you unwrap it into this helix like thing. And that's kind of fun. Um, okay, that's kind of fun. That's certainly worthwhile to study a little bit more, uh, but maybe not in this video, if there wouldn't be the last one. So in the standard proof, well, the, the, the standard proof that the fundamental group of the circle is the integers, which is kind of the only fundamental group you ever need to remember <laughs> in some sense. Uh, this proof fundamentally uses, or the standard proof at least, fundamentally uses this projection, this P map. So there seems to be a relation to pi one. And that's what we are up for. Remember, we were up for a relation to pi one. So far, so good. Maybe we're on the right track. And we play around with this example a little bit more. We still have the circle as one here. And well, instead of taking R, we kind of take R and cut it at one point and uh, pretend again that this is a circle. So we kind of have a long helix, that's R. Uh, but we don't take the full helix, we, we cut it into a finite piece, and this is S1. And we still have a map from this S1 thing, and I call it Pn, so Pn, in contrast to P infinity, it's this, it's this cutoff map. And it, it's a very naive one, it just raises everything to its nth power, and it has exactly the same properties. So let's have a look. Um, let's say it's a neighborhood here, um, has three copies of, of of exactly the same thing up here. So three copies of exactly the same thing up here. Here it had infinitely many copies. So of course you have, you have Z copies. And uh, here you have three copies. At every point has a neighborhood which is exactly the same on the circle. It just appears three times under this map. And yeah, and then there's something, you observe something funny. Okay, I can do this for any N, of course I can. Um, and I can also do the following for any, and I could look at the following subgroup 
Zn is a subgroup of Z. And this, remember, was pi one of the circle, right? So, um, and the Z mod N, these are all possible subgroups, so all subgroups. Not quite, of course, you still have the trivial one and the big one, the, the, the group itself, but let's say all non-trivial subgroups. That's kind of fun because that was kind of the question we were trying to answer. So what corresponds actually to subgroups of uh, the fundamental group? And well, in some sense, as usually in algebraic topology and in the study of the fundamental group, as soon as you understand what's going on for the circle, you kind of understand what's going on in general. And that's exactly then the notion. So let's read it carefully. So let's stay on this slide for a while. There are a lot of words here, and in the end, it doesn't matter so much. The main picture is the one in the middle, which are obviously stole, uh, not from Hatcher. So Hatcher is, is usually my main source, linked in the description, but from the Wikipedia page. Um, it's, a, it's a very nice uh, picture. It's exactly what I explained before. So for each thing in your space down here, in this notation, it's X, you have a certain number of sheets, copies of itself. So here's a circle, and you have a certain number of sheets up here, all of which are the same as the one down here. Okay, strictly speaking, let's say you have a topological space and the covering is a pair of a topological space. So here it was S1, so this is X, X twiddle in the other notation and this is X, together with a map P, which satisfies some nice properties. So it's a continuous rejection, very good. So you hit everything in the, in the image such that, and there's a point, those two spaces are locally the same. So each point has this, this, this uh, each, each point in the, in the base space X in the one downstairs has a local neighborhood, which is kind of reflected a certain number of times upstairs. And this, this, those things upstairs are called the sheets, right? So here, for example, we had this infinite number of sheets. Here we had three sheets and each one is just an interval, it's exactly the same as down here, same here, each one is an interval, a small interval, the same as down here. And here the sheets look like circles, so whatever you, your local neighborhood looks like. Anyway, so the, lo the local neighborhood is reflected upstairs. And that's a covering space. And then you have the crucial theorem, um, the so-called Galois correspondence. Okay, the Galois correspondence says if you have a reasonable topological space, uh, and as usual in topology, so uh, link is in the description to a nice book called Counterexamples in Topology. So if you don't phrase everything using the right adjectives, so here you want something like pass connected, locally pass connected, and locally simple connected or something like that, uh, theorem and Hatcher <laughs> for the precise statement, any reasonable topological space you will ever see in your life, as long as you don't want to construct counterexamples. Anyway, um, what I was trying to say is in topology, you always have to be careful. You can always construct counterexamples for everything because the notion of topological space is, is so vast. Um, just put the right adjectives here. And in practice, really, this works for everything. So I don't want to go too much into details. Um, I leave it to you to look at the corresponding theorem and Hatcher. Anyway, the point is this Galois correspondence. That's what I want to sell. That past connected coverings and one-to-one -one correspondence with subgroups of pi one. On the one side, you have a reasonable notion of equivalence. And on the other side, you also have a reasonable notion of equivalence. Um, one of them is isomorphisms of coverings, which I haven't even explained. But if you think about it, what it should be, you can write down the definition yourself. And on the other side, it's up to conjugacy of subgroups. And there are two crucial, well, two crucial uh, coverings you could think of because every group has two subgroups, uh, the group itself, and this is kind of the smallest cover. I will explain this idea of the smallest cover in on the next slide, which corresponds to the to the to the biggest trivial subgroup. And you have on the other side the universal cover, which corresponds to the uh, smallest subgroup, namely the, the trivial group. Okay, so this idea of coverings is basically built, or not quite, it's still very natural, but it's basically built to match to have this version of the Galois correspondence for topological spaces. So subgroups of pi one and one-to-one -one correspondence up to the reasonable notion of equivalence with um, uh, covering spaces. So let us uh, wrap up. Let me wrap up by recalling the Galois correspondence and actually how it looks like on the other side. 
or in the topological side, because it's really the same in some sense. So as a Galois correspondence, so here's an example, what you usually do is you have field extensions. So um, let's say you have Q and you have this field extension by adding a square root of two and a square root of three. Uh, this certainly has th three subgroups, uh, subfield extensions. Certainly you have the one with square root of, uh, of, of two, you have the one with square root of three, and then you have a slightly weirdish one, but you also have one with square root of six. So six is of course two times two times three. And this correspondence is inclusion reversing. So uh, the big field extension is a small one and the smallest one is the biggest one. And clearly Z, so the Klein four group, Z2 cross Z2 has um, three non-trivial subgroups. One of them is easy to see. It's, it's, it's spent by the element zero comma one. Um, the another one is also easy to see. It's spent by the element one, zero comma one. So one comma zero and zero comma one. And of course they correspond to the, well, up to the choice, which one is which correspond to the, um, to the easy to see field extensions. And then you have the one that is slightly more complicated to see. So my purple one here, that's spent by the element one comma one by the diagonal, uh, basically by the diagonal embedding. And it corresponds to the slightly more tricky to see uh, field extension. But the nice thing about this correspondence is of course that you just do your algebra on one side, you just play with groups and you find those field extensions. So in this case, you could, for example, say, oh, I missed my field extension, my purple one. But then I calculated the subgroups and it was clear that there ha would have to be one. And so, yeah, there is one and I found it then later. So that's what you usually do. And this is exactly reflected by um, covers and subgroups of the fundamental group. So uh, without going too much into details, um, the fundamental group of SO3, uh, the, the group of rotations of, of, of three space is Z mod two. Um, so the fundamental group of SO3 cross SO3 is again my client four group. So I have exactly the same picture uh, that I have up here, it's down here. And the universal cover of SO3 is S3. Uh, so the biggest one corresponds to this one. And that's easy to find. That's relatively easy to find. I'm just crossing everything, right? So if you know that SO3 has universal cover S3, then SO3 cross SO3 has universal cover S3 cross S3. Not hard. And then you get exactly the same picture. There's one uh, covering space, which is easy to find. There's another one, which is easy to find. And they correspond to the easy it's kind of the easy subgroups here and there's exactly the same correspondence as above. And there's a funny one, which I don't really, really know how to write in, 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 in a nice way, or I, I don't want to write in a nice way. And this corresponds to the diagonal embedding. So um, when I first looked at this diagram, I had actually no trouble to construct, well, be, because I knew that the um, universal cover of uh, SO3 is S3. So I had no problems to construct those three. And this takes, takes you a while to construct. And it's exactly reflected here because this is kind of the funny subgroup that's not so easy to see. It corresponds to the element one, one, but it's still reasonably easy to see. And as soon as you know this correspondence, you look at the right-hand side and you see, oh, I'm actually missing a covering space here. So then, then you would try to sit down and try to construct this diagonal covering space of S3 cross S3. Anyway, let me wrap up. So the Galois correspondence is uh, field extensions to subgroups of the Galois group is then reflected in topology by um, coverings of a certain topological space, nice enough, of course, and subgroups of the fundamental group. And then you usually, what you usually do, or at least what I usually would do is I would look at the group theoretical picture because it's a little bit easier and then try to see whether I found all coverings on the other side. But it's not necessarily, it's a correspondence. So you can also go the other way. And it's kind of what's happened in this proof that uh, pi one of the, of the circle is Z because the universal cover is R and you, R is easy, you play around a little bit with R and you can, then can push it kind of to the other side. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.